Well, let's start this morning's marathon of interviews and starting with uh, South African Airways. Now, the South African Airways business rescue practitioners have requested yet another extension from creditors to submit their final plan. And this in order to allow unions more time to study the document. Now, the deadline was yesterday. The national carrier was placed under business rescue in December 2019 due to, amongst other things, mismanagement of funds. And joining us now is uh, uh, analyst Kaya to talk to us about SAA's financial woes. Uh, Kaya, thanks so much for speaking to us. Welcome to Morning Live. Thank you and good morning to the viewers. So yet another postponement, another delay, one of several. What are your thoughts on this at this point, Kaya? Well, I mean, the problem with this is that it's become beyond embarrassing. It is difficult to imagine how any team task is rescuing any business could think it is justifiable for them to not only miss every statutory deadline, but to simply, at the very last hour, every time, ask for an extension. So we do know that legally this process should have been completed long ago because, again, it's important to remember that a business rescue is a business that's under strain, trying to preserve as much um, um, as much of itself, of its financial sustainability as possible. So you want the business rescue process to be completed within the shortest time frame possible. And unfortunately, this team of business rescue practitioners has completely ignored that type of principle. And not only have they ignored that type of principle, they haven't been able to publish any draft that is worth engaging on. And last week, when they eventually did say that there was something on the table, it turns out that it was so flimsy and it was so sparse, a lot of people actually don't have a basis for engaging on that document either. So yesterday's postponement was actually not surprising given how they've conducted themselves since December last year. It raises once again the question of consequence management, Kaya, because as you say, uh, these deadlines have been missed, but one can argue that they are being missed with the tacit approval of those who are supposed to have oversight over the business rescue process. The difficult thing, of course, is that you've got this inherent tension between the shareholder being represented by the Department of Public Enterprises and the major creditors being the banks who unfortunately actually have nothing to lose because if you remember the major banks all have state guarantees so for them it is completely irrelevant whether the plan is published today or in 10 years time because they are going to get whatever is due to them because the state is paying for them the people that are suffering the most are the unsecured creditors the people that are hoping something will be rescued and also the employees who are in limbo who don't actually know what their employment status is between yesterday and today so you really have a bizarre such a, a situation here where the people that are sitting around the table have multiple levels of vested interests. Some couldn't be bothered by what the plan looks like because they're going to get their money back and others are really, really interested in seeing what the plan is about but it appears that their voice is actually not as loud as the people who actually have got nothing to lose. So a few questions from what you've just said. Firstly, is there anything to be rescued out of SAA and if so, how? And also, the business rescue practitioners were appointed because the matter we were told was urgent, Kaya. So what are the financial repercussions of these delays for an already battered airline? Well, this is a, a complicated question, complicated by the fact that no one can answer whether there's anything worth rescuing in SAA because SAA, even long before the business rescue team came on board, believed that publishing financial statements was an administrative option. So if they didn't want to do it, they simply didn't do it. So, of course, in the absence of audited financial statements, we actually don't even know what the true state of affairs is. We do not know what the sum of assets is. We do not know what the sum of liabilities is. So it's remarkably difficult to answer the question of whether there's anything left to rescue. On the parts of the financial statements that some of us have been able to see, it looks like there are many more liabilities compared to the assets, which means that there's quite simply nothing left to save. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is that in last week's draft plan, the business rescue team had then said they need 600 million rand to pay off the creditors that existed before this business rescue process was undertaken. Now that 600 million rand is not actually even enough to pay their most famous creditor, which is Comair. So we know that they owed Comair around 800 million rand in December alone. So if this business rescue team is only trying to raise 600 million to pay those creditors, you know very well that every single 
creditor is going to get a fraction of what is due to them. So those are the type of problems that you're seeing here. And obviously, the fact that SAA and every other airline has not been able to even fly or generate revenue since December simply means that their financial situation, however perilous it was at that stage, has actually only become worse over the past couple of months. You also say that banks, in your opinion, had no business lending money to SAA. Why so, Kaya? Well, I think the main issue there is that the basis of lending to any organization should be based on its capacity to actually indicate to you this is our current state of financial affairs, and the best way to indicate what your state of financial affairs is is to actually in, uh, show people what your financial statements look like. SAA was not in the business of doing that. And also, even if it was, the way the banks tend to do things is that they'd really scrutinize what your pre-existing lending obligations are. They'd look at your capacity to raise revenue, and then they'd work out whether you are likely to be able to pay them back on the basis of your operating model at the time, in, at the point in time when you're actually asking for the money. So in the absence of financial statements and really in the absence of you indicating the roadmap towards sustainability, every single bank should have said, we actually cannot lend you any money. But of course, we now know that what the government would simply say is that, well, if you don't trust SAA, trust us. So give them the money, and if anything goes wrong, we'll pay you whatever SAA cannot pay you. So that is really how the state guarantee framework works. And of course, in this instance, it's the same banks that are now participating in this business rescue process with absolutely nothing to lose because whether you close SAA today or the week after, they will simply go to the state and say, where's our 16 billion rand and they will get it. And with regard to the state and its views and its approach to what's happening with not just SAA but SA Express and uh, the aviation industry as a whole, um, government's economic reconstruction document, Kaya, which says a national aviation industrial strategy is needed. What's your view on that? It is not a government document yet. It's an internal ANC discussion paper that has been authored by Ino Kodongwana. And of course, when they do talk about the national um, aviation strategy, there has to be an aviation strategy for a country like ours, particularly because the countries around us, being the SADC region, do not individually or even collectively have the same capacity to run an aviation sector that South Africa has. So, of course, South Africa must play a critical role in actually just getting the mobility in the region to become a thing. Now, the problem, of course, is that, again, this is a document that is being crafted by the same politicians whose track record in running even a single um, you know, um, aviation asset is so remarkably poor, it is difficult to imagine how they can actually say that they're going to put together a strategy and that strategy is going to be quite successful. They couldn't run SA Express, which is probably one of the easiest and the you know, most straightforward operations to, to run in the aviation sector. That in itself is in business rescue. They couldn't run SAA and we now know the consequence of that is that we're talking about this conversation today. So it is difficult to imagine how any aviation strategy crafted by the ANC with its current ideological outlook and its commitment to running assets that it has no capacity to run could actually be different from what it had before. And um, my apologies, you, you're right, it's, it's an ANC document that we were told was leaked and Inoko Dongwana came out saying that that particular document is not necessarily uh, what the ANC is uh, putting on the table or necessarily deliberating about it. It's a view that's being expressed. But uh, what's your take in terms of where we go to from here? As you say, if we take a look at what's happening at SA Express, for example, Kaya, uh, where we saw that, for example, monies were deducted from employees uh, for taxes that was not paid over to the revenue service or uh, the UIF. W what should we make of how these entities have been handled to date and where this could possibly go in the future? Should, the, should government, as it were, still have their hand on the levers of these institutions if they were to be rescued somehow? <laughs> The problem is not necessarily whether the government has a stake in any of these assets or not. The bigger problem comes in when this ANC government insists on finding perhaps the least competent and the least able 
individuals from within its ranks and getting them into these critical positions of authority only for them to surprisingly, I suppose, screw it up altogether. So if you look at a situation like in SA Express, where obviously employees were we being told that your taxes are being paid over to the state, which is actually the legal um, uh, position, only for them to discover later on that that money was not paid. Well, that is just criminal behavior. There's no other way to explain it. The problem, of course, is that you then, unfortunately, have to ask very difficult questions, even of the revenue service itself, because according to that parliamentary submission that was made, on, on behalf of SA Express. This had been going on for around 18 months. It is impossible for SARS not to notice that an employer that has around 700 employees, that is a state-owned enterprise, hasn't actually made its UIF payments or its SDL payments or even its PAYE submissions for an 18-month period. It is absolutely impossible. So we have to ask the question of what did SARS know about this and what did they do about it? And then we have to go back to the people that were in charge of running the process at SA Express at that point in time, because SA Express had a CEO at that point in time. They had somebody in charge of the finances. These are the people that were taking money from the employees and were supposed to have paid it over to the revenue service, and they didn't do so. So we cannot let that one go. We have to ask the questions. We have to know where the money went. The employees of SA Express, well, at least the ex-employees, because now apparently they've been suspended indefinitely, the employment contracts, those individuals deserve to at least know what was really happening with their money. When it comes to SAA and SA Express, we've let so much go over the years, Kaya. Uh, people have simply not been held accountable. Why would it change now? Well, I, I suppose the problem with us as electorates and us as citizens is that we do unfortunately have a track record of letting far too many things slide. So even with this one, what you end up seeing is that it is the people that are most directly affected, which are the employees that are now at the risk of not knowing where their next meal is going to come from. Those are the ones that end up being at the forefront of trying to actually fight back against this particular problem. Unfortunately, what the employees have is that they've got reunions representing them, and we know that the unions have got this awkward relationship with the ruling party and the government, which means that whether the unions are the best people to actually challenge the state when things of this happen becomes very contentious. And I think what you've seen even now with the unions fighting back against the government saying that we want to revisit the, the, the public service bill, the unions have got enormous influence over what the government does. And I think sometimes the employees are the ones that don't get that get the best deal out of this. In some cases, obviously, you see some very good uh, work being done by the unions. And I think in the SA, uh, SAA example, they've actually done a lot of pushing back and saying, well, we don't think this is the way to go. Even now, the SAA business rescue plan has been delayed on the basis that the unions are saying, you're not going to ambush us. You need to give us time to actually consult and understand what is going on here. So it is possible for unions to champion the cause of the workers. And because they're the ones that know best what happens in these entities, a lot of us will pick this up much later on. Same thing with this SA Express tax situation. The employees would have at some point in time noticed that actually I've been paying my taxes, or at least I think I've been paying my taxes, but according to SARS, I haven't been paying my taxes. So there's a disconnect there. We never heard anything until 18 months later. So those are the people that are at the best place to actually identify what the issues are. And then I let the public, if need be, because if they're going to trust um, the, the people that have been appointed by politicians to act in their best interest, here are two examples that indicate that you should never do that. Kaya, thanks so much for your time. Kaya Setole is an analyst talking to us about South African uh, airways and the business rescue practitioners requesting yet another postponement, this time so that the unions can study the plan that they put forward. We're going to take a quick break and then I'll be in conversation with Herman Mashaba.